Are you a therapist wondering how to spend your best buck on CEUs? Are you confused with who the best presenters are out there? Do you need to develop more expertise in a certain field? Well, then today's episode is for you. Hey, this is Eric Nance, Dark Side of Therapy podcast, where we help clinicians figure out the tools of the trade, especially newer clinicians, so they can get better at what they do. Today's episode is going to be about four presenters that I think are really spectacular. And these are four presenters I've seen live and in person or interacted with. And I think they are going to help you fine tune your skills and make you a better therapist. Now, here's the criteria that I used, and this is my criteria. I think that a good trainer presenter needs to own the material. That means when you listen to him or her talk, you get a sense that they've been there and done that. They've been in the field, they've got their feet wet, they've even struggled. That's what I look for in a good presenter. They're not trying to sell you something. I've been to a lot of presentations and worked with a lot of different presenters who I felt have tried to sell me a product by saying things like, well, it's evidence-based or the research says. That's all fine and great, but I think a good presenter doesn't need to sell the product. It sells itself. The passion comes through. A good presenter looks passionate about what he or she does. So when they talk about it, you see that they love it. There's a love that happens there. They love to teach it, and they love to watch people learn and grow from what they're teaching. This one's really important that they're practicing in the field. I have a hard time listening to experts who give advice or feedback or who try to make me better at what I do who aren't in the field practicing. It'd be like me getting advice from a quote unquote home builder who's never built a home, okay? I don't wanna do that. I want a trainer and a presenter who's been there and done that and is currently helping people in the field, not just pulling together research, and not just pulling together data. They're doing the work. And the last one is, I think a great presenter allows you to walk away feeling like you can do something with the information. You ever go to a training and you're there for eight hours and those eight hours are up and you're thinking, what did I just learn? And how can I apply this to the field? A good presenter knows how to get the information to you and allow you to think, hey, I can do something with this immediately after the training is over. So I'm gonna start with uh, what may be my favorite presenter of all time, Greg Lester, PhD. This is a man who I have watched present about eight different times on numerous topics, but specifically personality disorders. So Dr. Lester has trained more people in personality disorders than any other presenter in the world. This is his stuff. And what he does really well is he brings into the discussion the people that have influenced him. So Marsha Linehan, Otto Kernberg, John Masterson, people who really helped develop the personality disorder field. And he's gonna show you exactly what you need to do to recognize the disorders. He's gonna teach you things like what a drama switch is, which basically is where a client all of a sudden changes their mood or behavior and you wonder what just happened. It is so clear to me when I listen to Lester, he has been in the field for a very, very, very long time. This is also a man that helped contribute to the personality disorder section of the DSM. So he really knows this stuff. And any trainer that I can listen to for eight straight hours and not wanna walk out of the room, I give him a lot of credit. He uses a lot of humor too. Lester's funny. You know, very few presenters, I think, are engaging in a way that makes you laugh, and he's able to do that. Here's the controversy. Lester is going to be one of the few presenters that says to you, personality disorders are not caused by trauma. And he's also going to say that borderline personality disorder is not caused by trauma. He tells an anecdote where he gave this presentation to, I think it was a population in Los Angeles, And they walked out on him, some of them, once he had said that. So 
we're kind of living in an age now where trauma informed uh, is the phrase of the day. And, and Lester goes against that, but also provides the research. And I would argue a lot of therapists are not well researched when it comes to personality disorders. But seeing Lester, I think, will be an inspiring experience that will lead you to want to know more. Now, my next presenter is somebody I've seen live twice, uh, read one of his books, and have done some research on, and that's Bessel van der Kolk, who is probably now known as the world's leading uh, treatment expert of trauma. Now, van der Kolk also is controversial in that he says parts of the DSM are bullshit. You don't hear that a lot from practicing clinicians, but he also helped form certain portions of the DSM, and uh, I admire him for being able to be that courageous. His best-known book is probably uh, The Body Keeps the Score, and this is really the idea that when we're traumatized, the trauma energy gets stored inside of us, and it begins to incapacitate us. So things like arthritis or, or joint pain, uh, physical ailments, being sick to your stomach, this can all be caused by trauma. This is stuff I never thought about before I saw Dr. Vanderkolk. And since I've trained with him or watched trainings with him, this all makes a lot more sense to me. And I can look at trauma in a very, very, very different way. Now, he's also got something going for him, I think, that a lot of people don't, which is he's outright said, I don't need to be liked by my clients to be helpful. I, I, I saw him say this at one of the trainings I went to. And he had uh, uh, somebody with him, uh, perhaps a peer, who said, look, Dr. Vanderkolk, everybody that works with you really likes you. So I thought that was interesting. But I think the most interesting part of the whole presentation was when he said, trauma treatment doesn't have to be complicated. When we think about trauma, we think about some of the big strategies like, like EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. We think about tapping. We think about cognitive behavioral therapy. And Vanderkolk actually says there's trauma treatments out there that are very effective that just don't get a lot of attention. Yoga, for example. Yoga is a great trauma treatment. Acupuncture, one of the best trauma treatments we have, he says. And then there's dance. Dance can be a great trauma treatment, mostly because of the rhythm. It's very soothing for the brain. But again, a lot of that information does not get out there because uh, I guess we can't call it evidence-based. But he's done the research. He knows these things work. My third presenter is George Harmon. And I came across George Harmon about three years ago, um, wanted to do a supervision training. And of all the trainings and presenters I'm talking about, he may well, in fact, be the one that is the easiest to listen to uh, for eight straight hours. What Harmon does better than anybody is be vulnerable and tell you like it is. This is a guy who I think, again, has been there, done that, has made some mistakes, owns up to those mistakes. And so you walk away realizing, you know what, I don't have to be perfect. He tells a story about a supervisee he had, and ultimately she had committed to come to a meeting. And I think it was a, a pretty big meeting, a lot of uh, uh, social workers, therapists, uh, it might even involve the court system. Well, she didn't show up. She didn't show up. And Harmon was pretty angry. And, and I'm paraphrasing some of this, but he said to her uh, through a phone call, I am so angry at you that if you were here, I would probably bite your head off. Okay? Didn't mean that literally. Well, the supervisee reported him to the school. So as he talks about... Uh, he says he's got a disciplinary report in his file for saying this to her. Even though she did not come to the meeting she promised to come to, uh, he's the one with the disciplinary report. And so his point is it can happen to the best of us. He also talks about clinical supervision being high-risk work. That if one of your supervisees does something harmful to a client, they're coming after you too. Or as he says, <laughs> they're going to own a piece of your farm. And that's really good to know because I think we tend to put a lot of it on the supervisee. I'm just the supervisor. But no, uh, you own everything they do to some extent. And Harmon really points this out. 
His course now is two days. When I did it, it was only a day. And it's called Clinical Supervision, Providing Effective Supervision, Navigating Ethical Issues, and Managing Risks. So I have not been to the two-day training, but I'm guessing it's fantastic. The last presenter I'm going to talk about is Dr. Daniel Amen. And I came to him almost by mistake. I was YouTubing brain scans, and he came up. And his TED Talk is called The Most Important Lesson from 83,000 Brain Scans. He's got a bunch on there, but this is the one that struck me. And here's why it struck me. Because Eamon asks the very, very important question. Why is psychiatry the only field of medicine where we don't look at the organ we treat? Okay. Now, Eamon does spec scans. He actually owns a company that looks at the brains of his clientele, which I think is phenomenal. And he's just making the argument, why don't we do this? Why do we rely solely on symptom presentations and information? Because as he argues, you can have two depressed people, but their brains are going to look very, very different under a spec microscope. But we would never know that because we don't get to see uh, those kinds of images. Now, at the, evolutionary, at the Evolution of Psychotherapy conference, which occurred back in December, I got to see two of his trainings. They were interactive, so I got to talk to him, which was great. And uh, it was interesting because he said a lot of this information, uh, it's almost like it, it doesn't want to get out. Because if we found more effective ways to treat people by looking at their brains, what would happen to the drug companies? You know, what, what would happen to the people that are benefiting by what we're not doing? That was essentially my takeaway. Because he's going to argue we can do things like nutrition. Nu nutrition is so powerful for helping the brain. Exercise. Uh, just leading a healthier life. He has all these different things we can do just for brain health. And I feel like this information does not get out there. Maybe because it's not popular and it doesn't sound very good. You know, we always want to take this clinical route. And Eamon's saying, no, we don't have to do that. We can keep it simple. And so I really respect him for that. At the bottom of the page here, you're going to see links to each of these uh, presenters' websites and curriculums. And I really encourage you to check these four out. Uh, as we keep uh, doing more and more uh, information, we're, we're going to add some other presenters too that I enjoy. But I think this is a great start with these four. And I really hope it helps you on your path to becoming a good therapist and fine-toning your skills. Uh, this is Eric Nance, Dark Side of Therapy podcast. As always, if you like this video, please hit like and please subscribe.